Is there a new Jesus revolution, a new Jesus revival? Well, one could take a look at the news and certainly say that something's going on here. After all, there was the recent revival at Asbury University that attracted tens of thousands of young people from around the world. There's this movie, The Jesus Revolution, that is a box office hit, uh, and it's opening even in more theaters as I film this in March 2023. Of course, Jesus Calling, one of the top books that's called a Christian book, and The Chosen, which is a very popular TV show purportedly about Jesus. So what's going on here? Well, the main bottom line I want to issue in this video is that there's no new Jesus. There's no fresh message. There's no new anything because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's word does not change. There may be that God is calling more people into his fold and praise the Lord if that's happening. And I certainly can relate to that. Hi, I'm Doreen Virtue. And for 59 years, I thought I was a Christian. My mom told us we were. I went to church twice a week, false church, Christian science. I read the KJV Bible since I was a child. I cherry picked, read it, but I was reading it. And I really was convinced that I was a Christian. But it turned out I was not following the true Jesus. I was following the made up Jesus from the false prophetess, Mary Baker Eddy, who created Christian science. And then later the false Jesus from New Age, who's called an ascended master, who said in both those camps, he said to be just a man, a mortal man who was a good teacher and a role model for us. Certainly Jesus is our teacher. He is our role model, but he's not a mortal man. We know from scripture that he was born of a virgin, fully God and fully man, and that he was the only one to live a sinless life while on earth. And we know that he substituted for us on the cross because all of us have sinned, Romans 3.23. There's no one who is good enough. We've all incurred God's wrath because of our sinful nature and breaking God's law and God's commandment. We're not saved by our good works, we're saved by God's grace and mercy through the shed blood on the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us. And then three days later, he arose from the dead. Hundreds of people saw him, ate with him, touched him, were in his presence. And then, of course, we know that he ascended and he's now at the right hand of the Father God, our Three in one, triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-equal and co-eternal. And we know that Jesus will return to judge us all. And we know that those of us who are cloaked in Jesus' perfect righteousness because of our faith and our belief in Jesus through God's grace and mercy, and because of God's gracious mercy and Jesus' work on the cross on our behalf, we know that as believers, we are given eternal life with Jesus in heaven eternally. And unfortunately, those who are not cloaked in Jesus' righteousness because they rejected the gospel, they'll be judged who they are, which we all deserve. It's because of Jesus that those of us who believe in him are not judged for our sins. I went to see the Jesus Revolution movie twice this week, just so that I could have a fair understanding of what's going on with that movie. First of all, I want to say that I grew up in the 1970s in Southern California. They captured perfectly the 1970s vibe, if you will, with that word. They captured the music. They captured the clothing. There was a very distinct clothing style back then. Um, the obsession with partying, with drugs, with going to rock concerts. Everything in this movie, even though it was really disturbing to see, was exactly what it was like in Southern California in the 1970s. Kelsey Grammer, who plays Chuck Smith in The Jesus Revolution, interestingly, he was raised a Christian scientist like me. And I have not found an article where he has rebuked Christian science, where he's renounced Christian science. I just haven't found one. He, like I did before I was saved, claims to be a Jesus follower. His character in this movie talked about sin and the crucifixion, which is something in Christian science you never talk about because Mary Baker Eddy taught that it wasn't real. She taught that Genesis 126 related to us here and now that 
just because God created us in his image and God is sinless, that we're still therefore sinless. And Mary Baker already taught that the fall in the garden in Genesis 3 was a myth. It was something we shouldn't pay attention to. So to watch a Christian scientist like Kelsey Grammer talk about sin and the crucifixion was very interesting. And I pray that God is working on his heart like he did on mine. Now, of course, we know that the true story of Chuck Smith and Lonnie Frisbee has been changed by Hollywood, as Hollywood always does. This was produced by a major studio, Lionsgate. And so there was things done for special effects, but some of them were very disturbing. One of them is the scene where the elders at the Calvary Chapel Church are upset that the hippies are barefoot and the hippies have been at the ocean where there's oil spills and many of them have oil on the bottom of their feet or dirt. And they are tracking this onto the brand new shag carpeting. Everybody had shag carpeting in the seventies. Now in the movie, there's a blasphemous scene with Kelsey Grammer playing Chuck Smith, washing the feet of the hippies as they're coming into the church. Now, of course, Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. So you might think, well, what's wrong with that? Well, here's what's wrong with this. This scene where Kelsey Grammer says that he's baptizing a person's feet in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is absolutely blasphemous. The baptism is a very sacred sacrament, and we should not be twisting it like it was done in this movie. Take a look. They're on that towel. And there's another one here. Yeah. Baptize these feet in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. There you go. Uh, welcome to church. <laughs> And kind of grossed me out too, is that I have this salad bowl and it's the exact same type of bowl that was used in this video for this foot baptism. So I'm throwing that away or maybe donating it. I don't know, but that's kind of gross. I also received a letter from a woman who says that she grew up in Calvary Chapel, including was in that first church as the hippies first came in and that she and her family were very close to Chuck Smith. And she was crying when she was writing to me and she said, Chuck Smith would have never done that with the baptism of the feet. And she said that instead, Chuck Smith said that he would pull the carpet up and that we could have just bare concrete floors. Calvary Chapel Magazine reports that in the 1960s, as Chuck Smith went to his church and saw a sign that the elders had posted that said, no bare feet allowed. He actually took down the sign and he confronted the elders. And so Chuck Smith pointed out, my brethren do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with partiality. Partiality is something that's called out in the Bible. It says that we are not to give special treatment to congregants who are well-dressed or who have more money. And so Chuck Smith was arguing that the elders, by having this kind of prejudice against the hippies and their bare feet, were practicing partiality, which is a sin. Chuck Smith quoted James 2. He said, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? I like that story much better than the image of Kelsey Grammer telling someone that their feet are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I pray that the people involved with this movie will repent for that scene and apologize. Now, we know that there's no perfect people. There's no perfect church. We know that. The Bible is filled with God using flawed people because that's all there is. Only Jesus was sinless. Still, we have to beware of following those who are consciously and unrepentantly practicing sinful behavior. Many of you know that I've posted videos and posts about the chosen and warning about this. And two big reasons. One is that they purport to be a Bible story, but they change the Bible. They change who Jesus is. They portray a false Jesus. Uh, they portray Jesus as sinning, as this clip shows. 
Maybe we should get going before they make a formal inquiry, hmm? Jesus, please don't do that again, huh? Yes, Abba. May I read? We'll see, hmm? Come now, we've got a long journey. What are you going to do for your mother for this in transgression, huh? Transgression, it's impossible for Jesus to have transgressed. The Chosen keeps showing Jesus as a flawed man, a false Jesus, probably because the Mormon Church is financing this show. Pesha is the Hebrew word for transgression, and it has nothing to do with our sinless Lord and Savior. And it's impossible for Jesus to have sinned. They portray Jesus as a insecure, nervous person who needed a sinful man's help in order to write and give the Sermon on the Mount, as this clip shows. Let's get back to work. How many sections are we up to? 19. Here's a little incomplete, huh? There is something about 20 that is more symmetrical. You could always shorten it to 18. Brevity is usually preferred. Which section stands out to you the most? Do not be anxious about your life, of course. Are there any sections that concern you? Give me your honest opinion. I know I don't have to say that, but... The whole truth. You know I won't be offended. It's all very striking, but if I do the math in terms of good news and bad, it seems like there's not a lot of good news. That is so offensive. How dare they say that Jesus, who God the Father created all of us and everything through, as we see in John 1, Colossians 1, and throughout the Bible, how dare they say that Jesus, who is God, needed a, a man's help to create the Sermon on the Mount, when we know that all scripture is God breathed, God created the whole scripture, he did not need help to rehearse the Sermon on the Mount. And those who give Dallas Jenkins a pass on this, who are soft on him on this, I have concerns about your discernment. And I pray that those who are being soft on him and saying, well, maybe it happened. No, of course it didn't happen. Have you read the Bible? The Bible shows God absolutely is sovereign, and he does everything with full intention, full force. He doesn't do anything halfway, like the false Jesus of the chosen. The actor also, I'm very concerned about this actor playing Jesus on the chosen and also in the Jesus Revolution movie. We know that Jonathan Rumi is a practicing Catholic. We know that he offers prayers and rosaries and prayers to saints, which is dead humans, which is mediumship, which is condemned by God in the Bible, Old and New Testament. And we know that he points people to this hollow app, the number one Catholic app, and it's very concerning. Hello, and welcome to Pray 25. This Advent, we're so excited to prayerfully journey together with Mary. Advent is a beautiful season in which we prepare to invite Jesus into our hearts and homes at Christmas. And who better to lead us through this season than the woman who was there at the start of it all? We'll lean on Scripture to help us understand and grow in these virtues, and on Mary as we ask for her help in opening our hearts to Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And we also know that there's people who say, and they've written this, that when they close their eyes now and they picture Jesus, they picture Jonathan Rumi. So people may be following Jonathan Rumi, which is scary, because then you'd be following a false teacher and a false Jesus, potentially. So for this role, Jonathan Rumi has boasted that he went to Lonnie Frisbee's grave. He, of course, in the Jesus Revolution, Jonathan Rumi played the part of the late Lonnie Frisbee, who was one of the men instrumental in the growth of Calvary Chapel, who brought the hippies in. And so Jonathan Rumi says that he went to 
Lonnie Frisbee's grave and laid down next to him and prayed to Lonnie Frisbee. This is what he said in this interview. I sat down and I prayed with him. Um, the, the, the space just to his right is empty. So I got to sit down or lie. At one point I even lied down because I just thought it would be kind of interesting to try to connect in some way. That's probably more information than you need or may even want to publish. But that said, uh, I, you know, I, it's the, the truth. And so I finished praying with him. And I said, Lonnie, I want to honor you with this film. And I really want to, um, to, to, to bring justice and, and, you know, the testament to the gifts of God's grace and, and powers that you, you know, displayed while you were on this earth. And so if this is a good idea that I do this film, have somebody give me a sign, give me a sign, have God give me a sign. Mm -hmm. And the minute the words left my mouth, behind me, there was a door open to the cathedral and this giant cord rang out for about five seconds. And then from the organ, from the organ. Wow. Oh, I heard that. And I was like, okay, thanks for that. <laughs> Jonathan Rumi says he prayed with a dead person, but Roman Catholicism and Protestantism are very different. We know that. The Roman Catholic tradition is held on the same regard as the Holy Bible. And tradition is, is not the Bible. It's not God's word. And so the tradition is the belief that the Apostle Peter was the first pope and that the succession came from Peter and that the pope is on the same level as Jesus, which is blasphemy, absolute blasphemy. And their tradition is that they pray the rosary. The rosary is not in the Bible. So there's real concerns about Jonathan Rumi. And of course, again, God can use flawed humans. He's used me. I'm a flawed human with a very sinful past. And my old work is still sold by other people. So, you know, the main thing is to not follow people, make sure we're following Jesus, and then make sure that we're following the real Jesus. One of the most convicting and frightening verses in the Bible is where Jesus explains that some people upon their death will come to him and will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And Jesus will look at them and say, away from me, you workers of inequity, I never knew you. And why is it that Jesus didn't know those people? Because they were following a different Jesus. That's my main warning on all of these things, you guys. Jesus calling is not the real Jesus. That is a woman who is channeling the same voice that I was when I thought I was channeling Jesus in the new age. She's channeling this Jesus who is coming across like a creepy romantic figure. She puts chapter and verse of Bible numbers in the bottom of each page of Jesus calling, but she never writes the whole verse out because then someone could compare what she's writing to scripture and see that they are polar opposites. She also, in Jesus Calling, she changes the words in different printings as she's confronted for making mistakes. For example, and this is from Warren B. Smith's very recommended book called 10 Scriptural Reasons Why Jesus Calling is a Dangerous Book. And I'll have a link to purchase this book and his other book called Another Jesus Calling in the description below. So as an example of the changes that Sarah Young makes in her book, Jesus Calling, in the original edition, January 28th, she wrote that her Jesus said, I am with you always. These were the last words I spoke before ascending into heaven. I continue to proclaim this promise to all who will listen. And Christians who know their Bible said, wait a minute, that is not the last thing that Jesus said. So what did Sarah Young do? She didn't apologize. She didn't admit that she, oh, I made this up and this is just channeling my imagination and probably some demons pretending to be Jesus, like 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 and 15 warn us that Satan masquerades as an angel of light and that those who are working for us can appear to be workers of righteousness. No, Sarah Young did not apologize or repent. She instead just quietly changed the next edition. So now, January 28th, 
says, I am with you always. I spoke these words to my disciples after my resurrection. I continue to proclaim this promise to all who will listen. And Warren B. Smith in his books gives many examples of the biblical absolute heresy and blasphemy of Jesus Calling. I also want to recommend this book, Christian Journaling or Psychic Channeling by Brenna Scott. And this book is an explanation of the new age and occultic messages in Jesus Calling, comparing them to occultic and new age books. So I'll have the the link to that by that book in the description below. My point is that if there's a Jesus revolution and revival right now, fantastic. If God is using these imperfect means, but I pray that it points people to God's word and the real Jesus, not the fake made up Jesus that is called a wish granter. I have attended Calvary Chapel Church, and I can say that the ones that I've attended, they do preach exegetically, meaning they go line by line through the Bible. They are all different. Every church is different. Calvary Chapel does not require a seminary degree, but they do have a Bible college that pastors can go through. And as of this filming in March 2023, Calvary Chapel does not ordain women as pastors, which is great because it's not biblical for we women to be pastors. Women can evangelize, women can teach such as videos like this, but we cannot be at a pulpit teaching to men. That is unbiblical. So uh, I praise the Lord for that. Some Calvary chapels go into this type of exegesis called typology, which I studied in seminary. I find it fascinating. And typology is the foreshadowing of Jesus that we see in the Old Testament. Typology is a symbolism. For instance, in the tabernacle, you can see the foreshadowing of Jesus. You can see the foreshadowing of Jesus when Abraham went up on the mountain and was told to slay his only son that he loved. You can hear the echoes of John 3.16 there. So you can see types and shadows of Jesus throughout the Old Testament. And Calvary Chapel is famous for highlighting the typology. Typology, in the opinion of a lot of theologians, can go too far where you're looking for types and shadows where it's not there. So just be careful with that. It can get into even uh, eisegesis where you're seeing yourself in scripture. So you do want to watch out for that. I also have concerns with some Calvary chapels playing music from heretical churches like Bethel and Hillsong. And as I've told you before, Michael and I went to Hillsong Church when we were first saved because we were fans of the music. It led us like a fishing pole right into Hillsong Church, and only by God's grace that we knew enough of the Bible to know that what Brian and Bobby Houston were teaching at Hillsong, we knew enough that we knew it was heretical and we never went back. But people who don't know the Bible, that's the concern. So in the Jesus Revolution movie, I was happy to see that frequently throughout the movie, Chuck Smith held up the Bible and said, this is God's word. Let's open it together as opposed to Joel Osteen that you see holding the Bible and said, this is God's word, this is who I am. And there's no call to open the Bible in his feel good, get rich word of faith sermons. Chuck Smith told people to open their Bible and took them line by line through the Bible. So this is something that's very encouraging. And also with the Asbury revival. Now, I did not spend that much time looking at it. Um, Mostly what I was seeing was feedback from people who were there. Um, People wrote me who went there and some uh, pastors who I follow. It seemed like it was an open mic session, like a giant TED talk where people would get up and some would share the gospel and some would be more from a hyper charismatic standpoint. I was concerned that there were cards apparently distributed at the Asbury Revival promoting an unbiblical and mystical practice called Lectio Divina, which is a close relation to contemplative prayer. And what that basically does is it calls you to read the Bible through your own wants and needs and thoughts. It's called eisegesis. It's reading yourself into the Bible. It's 
reading the Bible and saying, what does this mean to me? Now, that can be useful in context uh, in a Bible study, but it would only be used sparingly and usually under the supervision of a qualified Bible teacher. You don't want to be doing Lectio Divina at a place that encourages mysticism. That's where you're going to go into getting false messages, false prophecy. You're going to think that your wishful thinking is coming from God. There could be a demon coming in and whispering in your ear to do something unbiblical, like happened to me. I thought it was angels. I thought it was from God. It was from demons. And now that I've read the Bible, I see that I did things that were absolutely against God's law and I've repented for them. So you want to just be careful with that mysticism, which brings me to another part of the Jesus Revolution movie that is concerning and actually confused my um, my Christian women friends who I went and saw the movie with. And that's the introduction of the false prophetess, the late Catherine Coleman. We rebuke this demon of cancer in the mighty name of Jesus. Whose wheelchair is this? Uh, this is this well, 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 all right, I'll get this. Well, what is this over here? Sinus is gone in Jesus' name. As the power of the Holy Ghost is just going through this body, we give it a praise. There's somebody getting a healing here for leukemia in the name of Jesus. I rebuke that leukemia. There's somebody getting a leukemia healing. Take it right now. There's, some, there's multiple sclerosis someplace through here. And the power of God on that one, it's multiple sclerosis, and you're someplace through there. The power of the Holy Ghost is going through that body. I give you praise, wonderful Jesus. There's also a hernia through here. There's a hernia hitting, and it's through this part of the auditorium. I give you praise. <laughs> the power of God has gone through this body, the power of the Holy Ghost. Who was introduced at Calvary Chapel. Uh, apparently, Chuck Smith endorsed her, as, and uh, Lonnie Frisbee was influenced by her. Catherine Coleman was also the influence of Benny Hinn, who's a definite heretic and false teacher. Uh, Benny Hinn even wrote a book about Catherine Coleman and the influence that she had on him. Catherine Coleman reminds me a lot of my old unsaved self because she's running around in these gowns. We used to call them goddess gowns. That's how I dressed when I was a false prophet. And she claims to be a, a vehicle for God. She claimed to be getting messages from God. She claimed to be a healer. And being raised in Christian science, I was kind of wacko like that too, where I would claim to, um, I, I didn't, I prayed over people sometimes um, and prayed for God to heal them. And then I became a Reiki master, which is absolutely not Christian. No Christian should be involved in any sort of so-called energy healing. I've got videos on that. I'm going to put the links in the description below. Beware of Reiki. Uh, so I was involved with healing to that point, but Catherine Coleman claimed that thousands of people were healed at her events in a style that Benny Hinn later mimicked, where people would fall over, they'd be so-called slain in the spirit. And so her so-called healings were investigated by a physician, Dr. William A. Nolan. So he did a case study of 23 people who said they had been healed um, by a Catherine Coleman service. He did long-term follow-ups, and he found that there were no cures in these cases. In fact, in one tragic case, a woman was said to have been cured of spinal cancer by Catherine Coleman on stage, and she threw away her brace and ran across the stage at Catherine Coleman's command. Well, her spine collapsed the next day and she died four months later. A lot of these false prophets who claim to be raising people from the dead and healing people, they're aren't medical documentation about that. There just isn't. So I think that one of the things that's really tragic and could come out of this revival and revolution that's going on right now, if people are not steeped and grounded in God's word, is they could get false hope. A lot of false teachers will tell you that if you just have enough faith, 
that it's God's will to always, and then fill in the blank, to it, you'll always be healed. You'll always get your soul made. You'll always get more money. You know, you'll always have a big audience. You'll always be published. All of these promises that if you just have enough faith, and then when they don't happen, you're blamed for not having enough faith. Where we know that the Bible says that only the prayers that are God's will are answered. And even then it's by believers and that God says no to prayers as a way of helping us to get closer to him and to lean on him. So I'm very concerned if people get involved with word of faith teachings as a result of the revival at Asbury or the Jesus revolution movie or the chosen or uh, the Jesus calling books, if they get involved with false teachings it can shipwreck their faith. I actually know a young lady right now who was promised that her mother, who was dying of cancer, she was promised that if she prayed hard enough for her mother, that her mother would live. Well, her mother did die. And this lady will not go back to church anymore. She doesn't even want to hear anything about God. It shipwrecked her faith. And it's tragic. And um, please join me in praying for her. So this is one of the reasons that I issue these cautions is that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was not this feel-good, wish-granting, genie, hippie, Santa Claus that he was portrayed to me in Christian science and is portrayed in the New Age and some word of faith. He's not that. He is God. He's the second person of our Holy Trinity. He said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And he called people to obedience. He called out false teachers. He called the Pharisees a brood of vipers. He said that their father was the devil. Why did he do that? Because the Pharisees were adding to scripture. They were adding to the law, their own traditions. Sound familiar? And Jesus said to them that they were hypocrites because even though they added all these burdens onto people with these man-made laws that were not in scripture, the Pharisees broke those man-made laws themselves. And Jesus said that they were like cups and bowls that were clean on the outside, but on the inside were filthy. We want to make sure that we're not legalists who say to people that they're saved by their good works. None of us are good enough to create good works. All of our good works are filthy rags, the prophet Isaiah said to us. So the only thing we can say is that when we're saved, we're given a new heart and a new life. And through that new life, we desire to please and obey God. So good works flow out of salvation. They don't cause salvation. Big, important distinction right there. And it's one of the main differences between the Roman Catholic Church and Protestantism. The Roman Catholic Church says that you have to do things to be saved, including you have to be baptized. And we see in the Jesus Revolution movie, the heavy emphasis on baptism. As someone who was baptized before I was saved, I didn't know I was not saved because I didn't know what salvation was. And it was a very powerful, visceral, and emotive experience for me, but it didn't save me. And we want to watch out for what Diedrich Bonhoeffer, the famous German anti-Nazi pastor said about cheap grace. We want to watch out for just a sinner's prayer. And people think they're saved. They think they have a false assurance that they think that they are now going to heaven guaranteed and they think they can do whatever they want, but they don't have that conviction inside of them. And they're not reading the Bible. We want to watch out for that. Do I think people were saved who went to these Jesus movement baptisms in the seventies? Of course. Do I think people were saved at Billy Graham revivals? Of course. I met someone who was saved at a Joel Osteen event, very false teaching. So yes, I was saved in a very progressive Episcopalian church. Yes, because it's God who does this, but it's through the gospel. Baptism by water in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is a Bible-directed sacrament that affirms our salvation. Full immersion in the water while being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is the biblical mode for baptism. We're not saved by baptism. However, those who are saved are commanded to be baptized. Therefore, only those individuals who are aware of their sinful nature 
and are capable of repenting and giving their lives to Jesus are qualified to be baptized. Now in this scene, the actor who's playing the part of Greg Laurie is asked by the character played by Jonathan Rumi as Lonnie Frisbee, whether he repents of his sin. And he's given this real quick, make a decision, uh, almost like a sinner's prayer. Hi. Greg, right? Yeah. I've been praying for this moment since I first met you. Have you decided? Uh, um, uh, I don't know. You want to decide right now? Yeah. Yeah, I do. And pray with me. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. But you are the savior of the world. You are the savior of the world. I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to come into my life. I repent for my sins. I repent from all my sins. And I accept you as my Lord and savior, my God and friend. And I accept you as my Lord and savior, my God and my friend. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Greg, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this is where I have trouble with the movie um, is because when I was baptized, I went through classes uh, with the Episcopalian priest and had to also declare that I was a sinner and that I renounced the devil and Jesus was my only Lord and Savior. But at that time, and that was February 2017, I didn't know that I was a sinner. I wasn't convicted yet. I hadn't you read Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12, that showed me that everything I was doing in the new age made me as a person, a despicable abomination to God. And that wasn't until a few months later when I read that. And that's when I was completely finally convicted that I am a sinner and that I didn't know what I was doing with my life. And I had to give my life to Jesus as my Lord and savior. So my concern is if people are baptized like I was before um, I did Bible study, that they could think that they were assured of salvation and think they were a Christian like I did for 59 years. And that is something that's very spiritually dangerous and it could have eternal consequences, meaning you could go to hell thinking that you are a Christian. So the main point is that if people are doing this, if they're getting baptized with a sinner's prayer or going to an altar call with a sinner's prayer, they need to keep reading their Bible. The Bible itself, of course, as we've said, is God breathed. Every word is God breathed. But in the new age and progressive Christianity, it's falsely taught that the Bible was mistranslated. It wasn't that there's missing books. There aren't. These are lies from the pit of hell to discourage people from reading and believing God's word. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Bible reads you back. The author of the Bible, the Holy Spirit, illuminates passages to believers and convicts us as we're reading it of our own sins and mirrors back to us the sins we read about in the Bible of our own sins so that we can pray for God to forgive us of those sins 
and to cleanse us of those sins and to give us wisdom to avoid those sins um, in the future. So the other thing is that, speaking of sin, Lonnie Frisbee, of course, has uh, a homosexual lifestyle past, and this is documented. He's even said this. Uh, tragically, he was he said he was raped by a male babysitter when he was about age eight, and this was an authority figure to him, an older guy, and so there was a lot of shame and anger and uh, apparently Lonnie didn't have a father figure to shepherd him as the Bible commands. Frisbee also drifted without a father figure and with the rape that he uh, experienced at age eight. He went to hate Ashbury, which was ground zero of the hippie movement in the 60s in San Francisco, where there was just drugs everywhere, uh, communal sex, orgies, just uh, do your own thing. And it was all in protest to the Vietnam War of that era. Now, I was a little kid, but I remember seeing all this on the news back before news was real um, edited or censored. And, and it was just everywhere, this hippie movement. And there was hippies where I was growing up in North Hollywood and in Escondido, San Diego County. So I saw all this. And one day at the beach, a young man, uh, he was probably about my age. At that point, I was probably 14, 15. He was probably about 16 came up to me and he was, I can still remember him. He was glowing. He was on fire for Jesus. I mean, it was a visible, palpable sense about him that he was just exuberant and big old smile. And he had tracks in his hand, just like the tracks shown in this movie. And so this kid gave me a track and he said, are you a Christian? I said, yes, because I thought I was. And he said, well, and then he real quickly bullet pointed the requirements to be a Christian. Well, you have to believe Jesus was on the cross and died for your sins. And you have to believe that he was the sinless. Um, and, and just these, boop, 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 boop. he said it so quickly that I asked him, whoa, 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 what did you say? And he said it again, but he didn't explain it to me. There was no explanation. And, and I was raised in a false church that said that there was no crucifixion, that that was just uh, a myth to control us and to make us feel guilty. And then the new age taught the same thing. And sadly, some so-called churches teach that today. My church was all about think positive, you know, it's just positive, positive, and the crucifixion's negative. So don't think about it. So when this evangelist kid came up to me with a track and was talking about the crucifixion, he might've well has been speaking a foreign language to me because it made no sense. He didn't stick around to explain it to me. He probably thought, oh, well, she's not gonna be saved and moved on to the next person. And it really taught me a lot about evangelism, uh, thinking back about it. First of all, his countenance, his presence, uh, it really did have an effect on me. There was something different about him. I mean, it was like a glow. And I remember that to this day. I wish he would see this video and I could tell him, thank you, because his presence did make a difference, but not enough to save me. Um, he, his tract didn't make sense to me because it was all about I was a sinner and I was raised in a church that said there was no such thing as sin. So that made no sense. The cross and crucifixion made no sense. So please make sure when you're evangelizing to someone who is completely spiritually blind like I was, to sit down and have patience with them and explain who Jesus was and is and explain the crucifixion and take your time with them because this can be a frightening and upsetting topic to someone who this is new to. And they may push back at first, but what you do is you plant a seed. We don't save anybody. The Holy Spirit saves people. We plant a seed. And I pray that all those who are going to see the Jesus Revolution movie and who are watching The Chosen and who are reading Jesus Calling and who are uh, who went to Asbury Revival, even though there was false teachings there, we know that seeds can be planted if they hear the gospel. The Bible says that God's word does not return void. That was true for me. I'd been hearing the gospel since I was a kid. Growing up in the 60s, 70s, and even the 80s and 90s, the gospel was shared on television and in magazines. Christianity was very, very much the norm when I was growing up. I remember Billy Graham being on the Johnny Carson show and not that Billy Graham was, you know, the most theologically solid Christian. We know he got into ecumenicalism uh, later in life, but he, he talked about Jesus on primetime TV is my point. 
and his crusades and his son's crusades have thousands of people. I pray that we who are steeped in the Bible do not discourage people from the Jesus revolution, but encourage people to see that as a starting off point. It was for me when I was in the false progressive Episcopalian church, and I was under um, a female pastor and a gay pastor, and the full gospel was sort of being said, but not really. But I read the Bible. That's the point. And so we want to point people to scripture. We want to warn them about false teachers. We want to warn them about sins. But we also want to, at the same time, encourage people to get to know Jesus, the real Jesus. And look at, I know that reading the Bible can seem laborious. It can even seem boring. It can seem confusing. But that's where Bible studies come in. There's lots of Bible studies. I'll put a few in the description below. Um, David Guzik of Calvary Chapel, his, his Bible studies helped me in the beginning when I went on Blue Letter Bible and they're free. I will always be grateful to David Guzik for his enduring word commentaries, and I often send people to them. And so there might be an Arminian versus a dispensational versus a reformed uh, viewpoint, but those are secondary issues. As long as we all agree that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, he was fully God and fully man, and that he died on the cross as the propitiation who was the substitute for the wrath that God was going to give to us for our sins. He was a substitutionary sacrifice in our place for the wrath that we all deserve for our sins. And as long as we agree that Jesus was risen from the dead, that people saw him, touched him, ate with him, heard him, saw him, and that he was ascended and that he's now at the right hand of our Father God, and that he will return. As long as we agree on that primary orthodox gospel, the rest are secondary. We want to watch out for false prophets, because the Bible does warn that if someone were to speak a prophecy and it doesn't come true, that is not from God, and that is a, a teaching that should be condemned. The Bible also warns that not many people should be teachers, because they'll be judged more harshly. So be very discerning about who you listen to, uh, it's important that we do join and are active members of a local biblically solid church that reads the Bible and that we participate in the commanded sacraments of one baptism and communion, or known as the Lord's Supper uh, Eucharist. It's important that we know that we're saved by God's grace and mercy alone and not by our works. But once we're saved, we want to do good works. So let's all pray for everyone at this point as the world is getting darker and more and more evil is out in the open and children and people are being treated in such evil satanic ways we need jesus more than ever and god in his sovereignty is allowing these false teachings to be about and i pray that they are springboards to true teaching through daily reading the bible and daily prayers for God to cleanse us, cleanse our mind, cleanse our hearts, and to give us his wisdom. We also know that Lonnie Frisbee disturbingly said that he got messages from God and his, about his ministry while he was on LSD trips. Now, back in the 70s, it was normal to take LSD. It was awful. But my friends and I would take LSD, and I want to say that it completely alters your perception of reality. But while you're taking it, you think you're getting what is called profound revelations. You think that you're getting the secrets of the universe. And I would write down those profound revelations that I would get while I was tripping on acid. And the next day I would try to read them. And first of all, my handwriting, because you're, you kind of lose your motor skills when you're on acid, my handwriting would it'd look like a child. And it was incomprehensible what I was writing down. And even when I could understand it, it was something that was so bizarre and not profound and not a revelation. The revelations come to us from God. His primary revelation is through nature. The Bible says that all nature speaks of God, the creator, and that even people who don't have access to a Bible can look at a sunset or a sunrise or a bird or a rainbow 
and can know that only God could have created this beauty and this marvel. Private revelation comes to us through God's word, through his God-breathed inerrant and all-sufficient scripture, the Bible. So please be careful with people who claim to have a new or a fresh revelation. Please be careful with people who claim that they have a word for you from God. You don't need that. Jesus is the only mediator between humanity and God the Father. God's word, the Bible, gives us everything we need to know. It encompasses every shade of human relationships, every type of human behavior, even though it's set thousands of years ago, and the sets may look different now, the same type of sinful behavior occurs as occurs now. And so the Bible teaches us how not to be like these folks and how to be more Christ-like as we are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In closing, I want to read you Diedrich Bonhoeffer's warning about cheap grace. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, Diedrich Bonhoeffer wrote, cheap grace means grace sold on the market like cheap jacks wares, the sacraments, the forgiveness of sin, and the consolations of religion are thrown away at cut prices. Grace is represented as the church's inexhaustible treasury from which she showers blessings with generous hands without asking questions or fixing limits. Grace without price, grace without cost. The essence of grace, we suppose, is that the account has been paid in advance, and because it has been paid, everything can be had for nothing. Since the cost was infinite, the possibilities of using and spending it are infinite. What would grace be if it were not cheap? Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy, which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ, for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye, which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. Ye were bought at a price. And what has cost God so much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. In the description below, I will also include links to find a good biblically solid church in your area. And if you can't find one in your area, move to be closer to a good biblically solid church or contact a solid church nearby to look at perhaps church planting in your area. It's that important to be active members of a biblically solid local church. That's where we find fellowship. That's where we find opportunities to serve. That's where we find opportunities to grow, to learn, to be disciplined if we drift away, and also where we can conduct the commanded sacraments of the Lord's Supper. And if we haven't been baptized once, to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May God bless you. 
May you be reading the Bible daily, Bible before breakfast, word before world. Thank you so much for watching.